Well, it's sure good to be with all of you and have another opportunity to study in the book of Acts. Last time we left off in Acts chapter 18 and verse 18, I think was the last verse that we looked at. We're ready to look at Paul's original uh, coming to uh, Ephesus, and then he departs back to uh, Syria to, to make a report back to the church at Antioch. And in the meanwhile, um, he leaves behind Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos, comes to town there in Ephesus, and there's some events that are taking place there while Paul is gone. And uh, then Paul is coming across on his third missionary journey, coming back to Ephesus. Um, and in chapter 19, we'll look at his work in Ephesus. Really, pretty much the whole chapter is Paul's uh, time in the city of Ephesus. Before we enter into our class, I'd like to uh, ask Brother Larry, could you lead us in a prayer for... Amen. Okay, so let's go back and look at a few of the verses we ended on last time. Uh, Paul left uh, the city of Corinth, and then verse 18, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Sincrea he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. So Paul goes from ancient Corinth there down to Sincrea, the, the coastal city there on the Aegean Sea, uh, and sails from there to go back to Syria. So it's sometime between the time of Passover probably and the time of Pentecost, sometime in the middle of April or sometime he takes off here. And he sails across the Aegean Sea and uh, comes to the main city in Asia Minor, which is Ephesus. And that's going to be sort of the center of Paul's activity. It really kind of takes over for um, Antioch. You know, all the missionary journeys came out of Antioch. But in the latter part of Paul's life, it sort of centers around Ephesus. We're going to see he works, he comes there several times, and Timothy is there as a preacher in, in Ephesus. And uh, you see how important it is in the book of Revelation. It's the first one of the churches that Jesus writes to there in, in Revelation chapter 2. So it, it is a very strategic location. It had the greatest harbor in Asia. And I'm talking about Asia Minor is that, that end of sort of the end of Turkey there on the western side of Turkey was Asia Minor in ancient times. A lot of uh, the Greeks came across from Greece and had colonies all over that area. So those were all Greeks that lived there. And uh, it's called Asia uh, among the Greeks or Asia Minor. And uh, it became a province of Rome called Asia was that part. And many important churches that are mentioned in the New Testament and that received letters are, are there in, Gal in that area of Asia. And all of them got their beginning because of Paul's work in Ephesus and what he's going to do there. So the main road to, uh, to the east started there, went to Laodicea and Colossae and on to the Euphrates River and all of the kingdoms that are in the east. And another road headed uh, for Sardis and Galatia also. There was a, see all those roads coming together there at Ephesus? Main Roman roads that came together there. And it had a great harbor. So they came to Ephesus and he left them there, Aquila and Priscilla. They, I guess, set up their tent making business there in town. And they started working in the synagogue and started laying a foundation for converting people to the gospel. And uh, now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So Paul, according to his custom, started evangelizing among the Jews first. That's what the Lord told him to do. They were the ones prepared to hear the gospel first because of the Old Testament teaching like we studied in the first lesson today. They had all that background that's important to understanding the gospel. And uh, there had been a colony of Jews there for over a hundred years. Uh, so a uh, large Jewish presence was there in Ephesus. So I guess big synagogue was there in that place. Uh, ancient people liked having the Jews come in because they were, you know, they, they worked with all, of, they all trained their children in these different skills that you need, whether it was a blacksmith or a tent maker or 
all of these different skills that you need in any town to be able to do all of the handiwork that needs to get done. The Jews had their children trained in all those things. And in, they, they were in finance too and, and, and loaning money and stuff. So they, uh, they were people you needed if you wanted to get a community up and running, you know, was have a group of Jews that were there. So they had been there in Ephesus and been there for a long time. Um, and he reasoned. He was preaching just uh, not just on one time, but uh, he kept reasoning with them for the few weeks, I guess, that he was able to be there. He preached one time on this occasion. In the aorist tense there that he reasoned this time, he's going to, He's determined to go to Syria, so he doesn't stick around. He leaves, but we're going to see they want him to stay. They want him to come back, and he does come back. He's going to spend over two, over two years there. Um, and when they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent. So he got a good reception for his first lesson, I guess, there in the synagogue. But he's determined uh, it's time to go back um, and report to the church in Syria and Antioch. But it's a good sign, you know, that they would ask him to stay, right? That's certainly better than the alternative, that they say, well, we should come back and study with us again. So uh, th there are going to be some successful work done while Paul is gone. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. And we know he goes from Ephesus there on the map. You can see he sails... The next place mentioned is Caesarea on the coast of Palestine. And he went up and greeted the church we're going to read, which seems to be Jerusalem. You always talk about going up to Jerusalem. And maybe with that vow that he took, there was some ceremony he needed to go through at the temple. So he, he evidently went to Jerusalem, and then he goes up to Antioch. And then not too long, he, stay, he stays there for some time, but then he makes his third journey starts. He gets back to Ephesus. So again, he says, if the Lord wills, if God wills, I'll return. <laughs> so isn't that exactly what James teaches in the book of James? You shouldn't say, oh, I'm going to go to this city and I'm going to trade and I'm going to do this and that and not say, if the Lord wills, I'll do this or that. We always recognize God's in charge over our lives, that we're not the final arbitrator on what we're going to do in the future. We don't know whether tomorrow is going to even be here for us. Right? So we always acknowledge God in all of, our, all of our planning. If the Lord wills, we will live and we will do this or that. And so there's perfect harmony in these New Testament books. It wasn't like James had his own gospel and Paul had his gospel and Peter had his gospel. They all taught the same thing. And you see that uh, harmony there from James 4.15 and what Paul has to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. And Paul says that on a number of occasions. So does the Hebrew writer, which was, I think was probably Paul, but uh, again, it's mentioned in that book too. So um, that's a, certainly a good practice for all of us to have, whether we say it out loud every time, but certainly we ought to think it. <laughs> the Lord wills. I will do this or that. I keep the Lord in my plans. Uh, Ephesus is, an, is inland about uh, six miles, five miles inland from the coast. It's on the river Caster is, I think, how you say that name, Caster River. And uh, in ancient times, they had a whole science devoted to dredging that river and keeping the silt out of it. Today, if you go to Ephesus, it's seven miles from the coast and all of that river silted over and the harbor is gone. It's just a marsh that's left and the city disappeared from history because it wasn't, once they quit uh, dredging that river out, it, it wasn't any good for a harbor anymore. So you see what happens when civilization, <laughs> the empire falls and the, they don't take care of stuff anymore and all the aqueduct and the harbors and all of that don't get taken care of changes everything, doesn't it? If, if, if you, you know, our forefathers dug all of these canals and things that we've got, and if we got people now that won't spend the money to keep them up, what's going to happen? They're all going to fall apart. All our highways, our bridges, everything. So you got to keep it going or it'll, it won't work anymore. 
And that's what happened to Ephesus. We'll come back and look in more detail when Paul comes back to Ephesus. So we'll look at the city and how it's laid out and when he really starts his work there. Uh, any other thoughts on any other stuff up to here that comes to mind? In verse 22, it says, And when he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. So there's some dispute you know, among different uh, brethren and scholars about, did he just go up and greet the church at Caesarea or did he go up to Jerusalem? Of course, in some of the manuscripts like it, that King James is based on, it gives you the idea even clearer that he went to Jerusalem. But um, even if that, pass, that, that is uh, not the best reading, it's still just going up seems to talk about Jerusalem. It was up there in the top of a mountain, <laughs> Mount Zion, and that, that's where you went. And then you go down from there to Antioch. It doesn't really fit with Caesarea going up and down that part. They're kind of the same. Uh, so Luke's language, it seems to talk about elevated Jerusalem there. And he greeted them, expressed his affection for them. And uh, that had been his fourth visit to Jerusalem when he went up there. And traveled back down to Antioch and reported to the church all about his work, just like he did on the first journey. Now the second journey, look at all the stories that we've studied <clears throat> about all that Paul did in in uh, Philippi and Thessalonica and Athens and what he did at Corinth. He could he tell all the brethren all about those days and the converts that were made and how God worked with him and the vision the Lord gave him and all of those things would have been talked about among the brethren and would have strengthened the brethren. There's a wide door of opportunity for faith among the Gentiles that had been opened up to him. So that's the end of the of the second missionary journey when he gets back to Antioch. It went from 51 AD to 54. Paul's going to spend some time there in Antioch and then he takes off on his third missionary journey. That'll be the rest of the book of Acts up until we get to chapter 20. Um, then he gets arrested in Jerusalem in chapter 21, 22, and he'll be imprisoned there in Palestine for a while and then go to Rome. So there's a uh, one more journey, I guess, the journey to Rome after the third missionary journey. Here's the third missionary journey. Starts in Antioch of, in Syria and goes back on that same road back to Tarsus where he's, he's from. Then you cross through the Cilician gates to Derbe and to Lystra and to Iconium and back to Antioch of Pisidia. He revisits all those churches from the first and second journey. Then goes across to... Uh, Ephesus, and he's going to spend almost three years there in Ephesus. And then from Ephesus, he'll start a journey to collect money for the poor saints in Jerusalem. And he goes up to, uh, to Troas and uh, goes around. He'll go all the way to Corinth. And then at Corinth, there's a persecution. Some people, there's a plot to kill him there. So instead of sailing from Corinth, he backtracks back around and revisits all of those churches again and sails back down to Tyre and goes up to Jerusalem and delivers the money from the Gentile churches to the elders so that they can take care of those that have been suffering from persecution and famine. And uh, that'll be the end of the third journey. So he um, does a lot of revisiting of congregations that he'd been at before on this journey. Uh, verse 23, and having spent some time there, he departed and passing successively through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So there's that Antioch uh, all the way back to Ephesus is covered there in that verse. He's going to go back through those churches that he'd already established. So uh, I've heard a saying about an old uh, evangelist said, you know, nobody should hear the gospel twice until everybody's heard it once. Well, that's not what Paul's view was, was it? There's lots of places that hadn't heard it yet, but he kept going back and revisiting the brethren and strengthening them. But you have to keep teaching people after they're baptized. You can't just leave them. So he revisits these churches over and over, and he tries to build them up, keep them, keep them faithful, right? It's not enough just to bab baptize people and move on down the road. You've got to keep working with them. And uh, here he revisits them again. And... Uh, He's made his last visit we know of to Antioch. 
So it's it was first we started with Jerusalem was the hub, right? Everything was about Jerusalem. Then it was all about Antioch was kind of the hub of things. Now it's going to be Ephesus, and in the end it'll be Rome. <laughs> you know that Paul and Peter and everybody there they're in Rome, and then and Paul wants to go to Spain from Rome and get them to help him. So um, everything kind of keeps moving to the west as far as the activity here um, among the Gentiles. And uh, so overland through, uh, well, I've mentioned all of that on the map before. Um, we know there weren't any, doesn't seem to be any Judaizers causing trouble right now with these churches. But later on his journey when he gets to Corinth, it's probably when he writes Galatians. And there were Judaizers coming in and causing trouble. And Paul hears about people that are... <laughs> departing from the simple gospel he'd been teaching and teaching a different gospel. And so he writes the book of Galatians. He writes the book of Romans, uh, First and Second Corinthians. We're going to look at the background of those letters on this journey uh, that he writes. So uh, let's see. So Paul reemphasizes, strengthens them in their faith. So this is, uh, how do you make people strong? You keep teaching the doctrine right. <laughs> educating people on what the Bible says, and that strengthens people's souls. If you don't have that strong understanding and, and, and truth being taught to you, you're not going to be a strong Christian, right? You've got to have that teaching, uh, systematic uh, uh, teaching of the doctrine of Christ. And once you get that right, it, it helps take care of everything else. So uh, fourth visit to the area, that's some five, six hundred miles Paul tra travels <laughs> across Turkey all the way from one end to the other today would be where Paul was walking. <laughs> he walks all the way back across and comes back to Ephesus. Meanwhile, <laughs> in Ephesus, while Paul was gone, we're told about what happened. So Luke kind of, uh, you know, we got another little episode in our story here where we go back to Ephesus. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. So while Paul was gone and Aquila and Priscilla were working there, Apollos shows up, and he is somebody that is very impressive. And uh, Apollos is from Alexandria in Egypt. There's on a map of Alexandria. is right up, uh, you can see, in the delta of the Nile River where it flows up into the Mediterranean Sea, and it was founded in 332 by Alexander the Great. It's, he loved to name cities after himself. He has Alexandria's all over the place, but this is the big Alexandria that everybody knows is Alexandria in Egypt because it had a lasting, uh, uh, it was a great city that he founded there, and of course it's known for the great library that was built there, the greatest library in the world. And they wanted a copy of the scriptures there, and they translated the Old Testament into Greek in Alexandria. So that's where the 70, the Septuagint, was made. That all the Christians had the Septuagint that, that were, you know, weren't Jewish or weren't Hebrews. They read that uh, that Greek Old Testament. And it was from Alexandria, and there were a great portion of the city was Jewish from the very very ancient times. Maybe Alexander had something to do with that. When getting that city started, many Jews moved there and lived there. I think it's a third or a fourth of the city was Jewish, so it was a big part of the city. And it was there one of their big centers of learning where people went and studied. And in the early church, it was the same way. They had a bunch of uh, schools that were there in Alexandria, like colleges, you know, where you'd go and study in Alexandria. So it was a very important uh, place of learning, and that's where this Apollos comes from. So he's a scholarly person, but he knows his Bible. That's the main thing. He knows the Scriptures. You know, there weren't a lot of people in New Testament days that could read, right? We have the letter that says, read this letter to the brethren, right? So the big, one of the big things was read the Bible when we came together so everybody could hear the Bible. And Apollos is mighty in the Scriptures. He, he reads it, he knows it, he's memorized it. So he knows his Old Testament, and he can teach it in a powerful way uh, when he comes there. It says he's an eloquent man, which is skilled in words is usually what you think of. But it also has the secondary or also idea of 
skilled in your reasoning power, that you're eloquent and that you have wisdom. So he not only uh, knew the Bible, but he knew how to present it, right, in a powerful way too. He was eloquent in the way that he addressed people and put his thoughts together and reasoned. And uh, so he's mighty in his Bible knowledge and <clears throat> he's able to teach. <clears throat> so the secret of his power is he knows his Bible. <laughs> But he knows also how to uh, present it. So he seems to be a guy of an honest and good heart. Uh, all of this learning hadn't gone to his head. He's, he's willing to be taught by other people and learn the truth, we find out, you know, when he's wrong. So you've got to think a lot about Apollos. Apollos was a great man, one to look up to. Uh, he didn't have it all right. <laughs> he, was, he was powerful, but he, only, he was limited in what he knew about Jesus. He knew some, some truths about Jesus, and he taught that right, but he didn't know it all. He didn't have the whole story. It says, This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. So he didn't have baptism right. That's a, that's a problem, isn't it? Still to the day, you can have somebody that's eloquent, that knows their Bible, but they can be messed up on some doctrine as fundamental as baptism, there's a problem. And Apollos needs to be instructed further if he's going to be useful to the cause of the gospel. And, uh, of course, it's going to be Aquila and Priscilla straighten him out. Let us tell you, the, like Paul Harvey, he used to have, a lot of people younger wouldn't even know who Paul Harvey is, but he'd tell you the rest of the story, right? And they, he needs the rest of the story. He's got Jesus up through the life of Christ, and he's got John the Baptist, but he doesn't have the book, you know, what we've learned in Acts. He hasn't learned about the Great Commission and about the coming of the Holy Spirit and all. He doesn't know that part. So he's got, orally he's been taught. Evidently, it shows the power of John the Baptist, doesn't it? That his influence, all of Judea and Galilee and all of those places came out and were baptized by John. And he was saying that Jesus is the Christ. He was point, he's the Lamb of God. So a lot of people were following what John said about that, but they didn't, they didn't have the rest. So he's fervent. He's boiling over in spirit. He's got great enthusiasm about preaching what he knows. And he's speaking privately and teaching maybe publicly, though maybe there's a distinction there, speaking and teaching uh, continually in the synagogue. And he's making a big impression on a lot of the people there. And... Um, but he doesn't know about baptism. He doesn't have. He still thinks John's baptism is going on, and he needs to be straightened out. Of course, John is Jesus. Paul's going to have to teach on that when he gets to town, because there's a lot of other people, I guess, influenced by him. <laughs> they are also messed up on baptism. So what do you do when people aren't baptized right? Paul has to reteach them and rebaptize them the right way, which is what we would do today if somebody doesn't have the truth on baptism. You teach them the truth, and you need to be baptized right. Do it the right way. Um, so, let's see then. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. That's what needs to be done. It's not he's a bad guy. Not, he, he just doesn't know. And that's the way I try to approach anybody I talk to is until I'm proven otherwise, they're honestly mistaken or they'd be believing what the Bible says on everything, right? And that's the way they look at him. I, they, they've got to take him aside, show him more accurately the things that he's not got right. And uh, so he's preaching real bold, but Aquila and Priscilla hear this and they take him aside. Don't, don't you think it was a good idea they took him aside privately? <laughs> Instead of, hey, man, you're not teaching right from... Call him out while he's publicly teaching. Say, man, you got that. Will, that might make it a lot harder to teach him if you did that, don't you think? You you embarrass him and you get off on the wrong. Isn't that part of tack? You try to do it in the right way at the right time with the right attitude, so that you make the gospel more acceptable to somebody instead of just being rude about it, right? Uh, they took him aside privately, and instead of denouncing him publicly. 
uh, fills in the gaps of his knowledge about Jesus and the way of salvation, tells him the rest of the story about the uh, Jesus uh, giving the Holy Spirit to the apostles and what they taught about what you're baptized into. Right? They, they would taught him all of that. Think of some of the things he probably wasn't acquainted with. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, his ascension back to heaven, justification by faith, the Lord's Supper, the coming of the Holy Spirit, baptism into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the difference between John's baptism and the baptism of the Great Commission. They're different. He needed to get that. That's a lot of important stuff they needed to fill him in on. And evidently he was baptized because we're never told of, Paul is approving of him and everything afterwards, so he probably was baptized correctly now. He knows what he's supposed to do. And uh, they're going to send him on with letters of approval to go preach in Corinth. So we know he got straightened out. And he does a lot of good when he gets to Corinth in preaching. And Paul mentions him in 1 Corinthians, right, with approval. So he evidently, he is a man with a good and honest heart. And when he, he learns better, he straightens it out. That's, I've had to do that in my life, haven't you? On, I've had to do it on a lot of things. Found out, well, that's not that's not right. I need to start doing it this other way. Yes. Right. Absolutely. It should be the humblest saint could come to you and talk to you and it should listen to them. And see what I might be wrong about this. I might not my emphasis might be wrong. Maybe I've been I hadn't taken this verse into account that needs to modify some of the things I'm saying about this. You know, you have to take a whole thing. Yes. Right. Well, that, that's an excellent, excellent point and an excellent il illustration of that principle. Uh, you know, you don't take things to the nuclear level right off the bat, right? And call people out in public. That's just not the way to do it. You, right. Try to keep it as keep it as small and quiet and where you can reason with somebody and egos don't get too involved in it and all of that. Just keep it as private as you can and you work your way up from there. You don't don't start on the other end. And it, it, it's something, you know, something how le a lessons, you know, you don't intend it, but they kind of go together. This lesson in the second sermon is on Jesus at the Last Supper where he reveals one of you will betray me and it points out, you know, to John that it's Judas. <laughs> and they all say, is, is it I? It, I could be wrong. You know, that, that has to be there all the time. Maybe it's me. <laughs> Maybe I'm the one that's wrong. And some people, they, it, that's not a possibility, and you're not going to be able to help a person like that. But if, if we're all going, maybe I'm wrong on this. Let's, let's study this. you got a chance, you know, then. And Apollos was open to it. He was open to hearing what they had to say. Some people aren't, and we don't, we don't want to fall in that camp. Um, you have here a, a woman teaching a man, too. You have Aquila and Priscilla, or Priscilla and Aquila teaching him, and uh, shows in that, uh, when it talks about that a woman's not to teach with authority over a man, it's in a public way. It's not talking about private Bible study with somebody. That's a different situation. And um, Let's see, verse 27, Apollos then goes from there to Corinth after this happens and says, When he uh, wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, uh, he helped greatly those who had believed through grace. <laughs> so Apollos did a great work in Corinth when he got there. He gets all of his ducks in a row. He gets the doctrine right now. He's still got the zeal. <laughs> He's still powerful in the scriptures. He goes over to work with the church at Corinth, and they send a letter. You, know, you see this letter of recommendation thing? The brethren write and say, Apollos is a good guy. Notice there's some disciples. So there is a church now. Before it was just Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla that we knew about, and he was teaching in the synagogue that one time. But now there's some, though there have been some converts. <laughs> Since Paul's been gone, there's already a congregation there. It, it might just been a handful, but you know they've got some brethren to write a letter over there and ask to say something about it. So it seems like there is a small group that are meeting there uh, already before Paul gets back, and uh, 
Apollos does a great work because he helps them. Uh, I guess the next verse will tell us, you know, about how he how he helped them. Evidently, they, they were having trouble still with the Jewish synagogue and the teaching of the Jews and opposing the gospel. And when Apollos gets there, he's powerful in the scriptures, and he's able to refute them in debate. And so that helps the church. I mean, it knocks down this opposition that they're getting there in Corinth. And uh, they were helped those greatly who had believed through grace. That's how all of us have believed, isn't it? God's grace is all of those things that He has done through His favor for us. He, he sent Jesus. He sent the New Testament. He gave us the Word. He gave us the church. And people in the church taught us the gospel. <laughs> so through God's grace, all of those gifts that God has given, we've come to believe. right? And uh, it's not some... You got zapped. <laughs> but God's grace is all of the things He does to give us blessings and uh, give us the Word and so on. And they believe by all that confirmed evidence that the gospel's true. Uh, For He powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So you see, there's still a, they, they were opposed to Paul when he was there. And it didn't stop after Paul left. They were still troubling the church. And this doctrinal stuff was going on that they were saying Jesus isn't the Christ, that he didn't fulfill those Old Testament passages. And when Apollos gets there with all of his learning, he debates them even publicly. And he shows these Old Testament prophecies apply to Jesus of Nazareth, that Jesus is the Christ. And he was able to... Uh, hold up that proposition that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ that they should believe in. He's the Messiah that was to come. And uh, he went to Corinth and that worked there probably about 54 A.D. when Paul sets out from Syria. And then Paul comes to Ephesus for over two years. Another passage he says three years, so two years and a half. or <laughs> something. You know, you could say it either way. Either way is true. He was there two years or three years, <laughs> according to how you want to break down the months. Uh, don't we round up and down all the time? We do the same thing when we talk about something. And uh, the uh, Apollos then returns and preaches in the vicinity of Ephesus later on, and he's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 16, 12. And towards the close of Paul's ministry, you get your last glimpse of him in Titus 3.13. So he was still being faithful at the very end of the New Testament, or Paul's life, when he was writing those last letters. Okay, he and Zenos the lawyer were together on some missionary journey there in Titus 3.13. So he's still preaching. All right, well, we'll Lord willing, we'll come back and look at Paul's work in Ephesus next time.